So let me, let me give you a little bit of story before we read our scripture. Genesis 28, 10 is where we'll begin. Amen. This is shortly after um, Jacob deceived his father Isaac and stole the blessing and stole uh, after he stole the birthright from his brother or persuaded him and tricked him or got him at his low moment to take that. And then he goes into his father and he steals the blessing that belonged to his older brother. And shortly after that, his mother devises a plan to send him away, amen, to, to escape his brother um, Esau because Esau had desired to kill him after that. And so that's where we're going to begin in chapter 28, in verse number 10. I'm going to read a lengthy portion of scripture. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night. And because the sun had set, taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were descending or ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your offspring, the land that he is about to run from, the land he's about to take off from. God says, I'm going to give it to you and give it to your offspring. Not only that, but your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your offspring shall all the families of the entire earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you, protect you, or guard you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. I'm going to bring you right back to this spot. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Amen. He named it Bethel. El is the word God, Beth, house. Amen. He named that place the house of God. Amen. Because of the dream that he had. Amen. Our title for today, our message today is the God of the house. Jacob is on the run from his brother and he comes to this place. He has a dream and God speaks to him in this dream and he sees this ladder and it's a a beautiful thing that I think we would all want to happen. I haven't had dreams that I can that I can look back to in my life and say this was the one dream of all the nights I've slept that this I mean something happened there's I've never had a dream where God spoke to me or dealt with me um, in this way so vividly that he would get up from where he is and say this is the place this is the house of God this is the house of the Lord this is exactly where it is this is exactly where I had that dream. This is exactly where I slept. And so he, he, it's so important and so impactful to him that he takes that stone and he makes this pillar there and he changes the name of an entire city to the house of God because what happened there, amen, was so important to him that he, he wanted to remember it for himself. But for generations, everybody, you have to remember that this is where I had this dream And this is where God spoke to me. And this is where I saw these angels. And there's something very, very important that happened here. And so he he, he makes that a point for people to know. There's there's something beautiful about that when we come into our first encounter with God. I mean, we come into our first encounter with God and he begins to speak to us and deal with us. When you first come in to desiring to live for God or you're first coming in seeking the Holy Ghost, 
Amen. There's a, a two-way communication there. Amen. The, the angels ascending and descending. There's movement there. There's something going up and down. And God speaks from the top of the ladder to Jacob. And there, there's no response from Jacob. It, in, a, in his dream, he doesn't say anything. It's just what he sees and what he hears. And he's, uh, he, he, he witnesses this thing. But when we come into the house of, the God, of God, the reason everything uh, we desire God and desire the Holy Ghost is because he does speak to us. And not only do it, does he speak to us, but we speak back to him. And there's, there's an exchange there. When you're filled and you're s- with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you're seeking the Holy Ghost, the reason uh, it touches you in a way so personally and intimately and the way that it has an effect on you so deeply is because not only are you hearing from God and responding to God, but he is responding to you. It's, it's, there's a communication that your spirits are, are connecting. And how could it not be so intimate and personal when the spirit of God moves inside of you and moves into you? It's, it's very specific. Amen. And it affects us in different ways. It's not like we all go out, say it was raining outside of these doors and we all, all go out and we would all get touched by some rain. We would all be in, affected by some rain. Uh, some of it would hit our shoulders and our heads and our glasses, and we would all be a little wet. And so, and and that's generic. But there's like specific raindrops that would touch you that wouldn't touch me. And that goes from generic to more specific. But even beyond that, when God's Spirit pours out, it's not just general. It's not like He was going to pour out the Spirit in this area, and you happen to be there, and you got some generic Holy Ghost. Or uh, you got this sprinkle and somebody else got this sprinkle. But when God fills you with the Spirit, it's the fullness of God coming inside of you and dealing specifically with you one-on-one. And he's dealing with your heart. And he's hearing the words that you speak and the tears that you cry. And when you lift your head, he's very personal. It's not a generic Holy Ghost that you can have. But he wants to be very personal with you. And And so when Jacob has this dream and means so much to him, even though he's not necessarily interacting with God, he's interacting with the house of God. He sees what's going on, and he's in the house of God, and that means a lot to him. It doesn't happen so much these days, but I remember when I was younger, when I was a kid, and you would have door-to-door salesmen or uh, solicitors, they would come and knock on the door, and if you would answer, they would say, uh, is the man of the house home? They, it's, they don't want to just come to your house, but they want who's running the show. I, I, I want to see the guy that is running the show. I want to see the man of the house. It's, or are your parents here? It's, it's not just the house that makes the difference, but there, there's something more important than just the house. But then he makes... Uh, his promise to God when he wakes up, he says, Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and he will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house and all and of all that you give me, I will give a full tent to you. So he doesn't at that point declare that this is my God. But he says, if you do those things that you said you would do, and I come back to this place, I go throughout my life, and you keep me the way that you said you would, and you protect me the way that you said you would, and you bring me back to my father's house in peace, then you will be my God. So Jacob goes down. He goes down to his uncle Laban's uh, farm, ranch, plateau, he goes and he lives and he works for him and he, he gets two wives and a couple concubines and has a bunch of kids. And he's there working for 20 years before they decide we can't do this anymore and we need to move back. We need to go back home. And so when he decides to leave Laban, there's a struggle. He, Laban tries to keep him there and keep his family there, but David or, but Jacob says, no, I need to go back home. It's been 20 long years. I need to go back home and, and, and uh, make things right. 
because I fled from my father's house and I was I fled in fear, but I need to go back and make peace and I need there to be peace in my father's house when I return. And so in chapter 32, Genesis chapter 32, this is some 20 years later, Jacob went on his way, verse number one, 32 verse one, Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And this is him leaving from Laban, Laban's house back to his father's house. And Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, thus shall you say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male servants and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he is coming to meet you, and there are 400 men with him. Assumedly soldiers or mercenaries or people with in, an intimidation factor. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with them and the flocks and herds into two camps. Jacob says, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do you good. When Jacob prayed this prayer, he begins this prayer. He still refers to God as the God of his father, Abraham, the God of his father, Isaac. And he doesn't call him, O oh God, my God. It's my Jesus. You're the one I'm after. <laughs> We, yeah, we acknowledge him as God. He is God. He's the one on the throne, but that's my God on the throne. It's the word of God, but it's my God's word. This is my God's word. Hallelujah. But why wouldn't Jacob be willing or confident to say, my God? And the next verse, I think, gives us a hint. He says, I'm not worthy of the least of the deeds of your steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. God of my father, Abraham, God of my father, Isaac, I'm not worthy of any of the love you've given me. And I think that's why he's looking at his entire past and all his actions and everything that he's done and has been through. He's always been a deceiver. He's always been a liar. He's always been cunning. He's always been crafty. Everything he got, uh, yeah, he worked hard, but he worked hard in a sneaky, scoundrel kind of way. And everything that he got, he doubled down and he stole in some, one, some way or another, secretly, or behind the scenes or what he was doing. And so when he comes to speak to God and ask God for something, he still doesn't feel worthy to call him my God. He's still outside. He feels like the blessings that he get are still only because of who his father was and the, his father's relationship with God, but not his own relationship. He doesn't feel that closeness to call him my God, even though God from the top of the ladder said, I'm going to give all of this to you and to your offspring. And this is what I'm going to do with your children. And all, all your seed are going to bless the entire earth. And it's going to be blessed because of you. But he still does not feel worthy to call him his own God. As a matter of fact, he says, I am your servant. Amen. For with only my staff, I crossed the Jordan and now I have become two camps. So he says, please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he may come and attack me. The mothers with the children, he will not have mercy on anybody. Then he reminds God, but you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. He reminds God of the promise that he gave him in a dream. And so he stayed there that night, and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats 
and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their calves, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. These he handed over to his servants. Every drove by itself and said to his servants, pass on ahead of me and put a space between drove and drove. I need to somehow win my brother's heart over. And he instructed the first, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, to whom do you belong? Where are you going and whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my Lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. And he likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. Say the same thing when Esau finds you or when you find him. <clears throat> For he thought in verse 20, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. And afterward, I shall see his face and perhaps he will accept me. Proverbs eighteen sixteen: a man's gifts make room for him and brings him before the great when you bring he's giving a gift to make a way for him amen it's, it's he's he's in the right heart i need to make this thing i've stolen so much from my brother i need to just give him so much and if he's not pleased with this or he thinks this is the end of the gift nope there's more on the way and if he thinks this is the end of the gift nope there's more on the way and if he thinks this is the more of the gift nope there's more on the way and it's all for him and it, if i give this all back to my brother maybe he will accept me he doesn't even feel not only worthy enough to call god his god but he's he doesn't he knows hey amen he needs mercy from his brother to be accepted by his own brother so the present passed on ahead of him, and he himself stayed that night in the camp. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two fe female servants, and his 11 children across the ford of the Jabbok. The ford is a place in a river where it's nice and low, where you can cross from one side to the other side of the river Jabbok. The Jabbok River served as the boundary between the promised land and the land of the Ammonites. He comes to this place, the ford of this river, and he sends everybody over. And he stays on his side of the river. When Israel would inherit the land of Israel or take over the Canaanite land, this would mark the border that God said at this river at the river Jabbok is going to be the end of your border. And when you cross that, all of that is going to belong to you. So the Israelites did not cross the Jabbok River to take over the Ammonite land. Verse 23, he took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. The name Jabbok comes from the Hebrew word that means to empty out or to pour out. He comes to this river that means to empty out. And he sends everything that he has, all his camels, all his ewes, all his goats, his wives, his servants, male servants, female servants, his children, Everything that he has, he sends over across the river into what will be the promised land. And he stays on this side of the river, poured out and emptied out. And at that moment, in the oddest way, a man comes up and just decides to wrestle him. <laughs> and that's how I know God has a sense of humor because it just, I don't get it at all. All right, come at me, come at me. And they just start wrestling all night. But everything is gone. He's down to nothing. And God shows up to meet him there. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, they wrestled all night long. They wrestled all night long. And Jacob has nothing. He's passed it all on. And they wrestled all night long. He touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Because he has zero. 
He just, by faith, passed it all into the promised land. Not knowing what was coming about, not knowing what Esau was going to do, he gives it all up, and now he's at zero. I will not let you go except you bless me because I need something. I'm here alone. I've given it all up. All my strength is gone. All my wealth is gone. My reputation is gone. Everything I lean on or have confidence in is all gone. I gave it all up. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked him, well, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. In some places, it's Penuel. He says, he names it Peniel. Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is delivered or preserved. Again, Al is God. Beth Al is the house of God. Peniel is the face of God. He names one city Beth Al because of his interaction with the house of God. His encounter with the house of God. But he names the second place Peniel because of his encounter with the face of God. And there's a difference. We come into this house. We're in this place. Our hands are lifted. We can feel God around. And we can feel goosebumps and chill bumps and being excited and expired and feel the warmth and the goodness of God and feel the mercy of God. And there's an atmosphere of praise in this place. And we feel God come into this place. And all those things are interactions with the house of God. Visitors come into this place. They come into and they feel, oh, man, it feels great in here. I I love what I feel in here. That's an interaction with the house of God. That's an encounter with the house of God. Sometimes they go, they don't go any further. Any one of us, even if you've had an encounter with God and the face of God before, amen, we can come into the house and get you like, okay, that's good. The house of God is good enough because it makes me feel good. And I, I can come into the place and we leave and we're not changed. When he came into the house of God and he's, And he saw the ladder and he saw the angels. He named the place. He changed the name of the place from Luz to the house of God. But he himself was not changed. Until he had an encounter with the face of God. And every one of us, no matter where we are in our walk with God, need to get to the face of God. And have an encounter with the face of God. Because we need to be changed more and more and more until we can be closer to him and more like him so that when he comes and that trumpet sounds, the change is not too quick. It's just one more step. So the sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. And there was evidence in him that he had an encounter, something that was real, something that he could live, leave with and say, yes, this actually happened. Because you can have a dream and say, I don't know if any of that was real or not. I don't know if that was a dream. I don't know if that was a vision. I don't know what that was. And you can convince yourself that what happened didn't really happen because there's no evidence there except that there was a stone there that he put But when he had an interaction or an encounter with the face of God, something happened to him that he could never leave because it became a part of who he was. And it changed the way that he walked forever. And how do you know you had an encounter with God? Because the scars or the the limp is still here. I still have the effect. That's something that stays with you forever. When you get to that place, you you will never be the same. And you will never walk the same. You will never see life the same way. You will never see time or eternity the same way if we can get to an encounter with the face of God. 
It's not enough for us. We're all close to the house of God. We're all involved in the house of God. We've all been close to the ladder. We've all been in the presence of angels. We've all felt the house of God. Amen. But how many, how, how many say, Lord, I don't want to be satisfied with that, but I want to get to that place where I have an encounter with your face. It's something different. David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after all the days of my life. Not only to dwell in the house of the Lord or to dwell in Bethel, but to, amen, behold the beauty or the encounter of his face and to inquire in his temple. David wanted the same things for himself that Jacob had, not only in an encounter with the house of God, but the encounter with the face of God. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And when the man... <clears throat> or verse 33, and Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and two female servants, with the servants with their children in front, Leah and her children, Rachel, in the back. So when he counters Esau, Esau runs to him and he falls on his neck and he's crying and he's weeping. And he says, what are all these gifts? And he says, they're gifts for you. And Esau says, no, I've been blessed. I got more than enough. Keep everything that you have. And Jacob said, no, just, just accept this gift. If you accept me in any way, accept my gift. So Esau does. He says, come on, let's go back home to Seir. And Jacob says, no, my kids are tired. My flock's tired. I'm worried about them. You go ahead. And we'll catch up to you. So Esau says, okay, well, how about I leave some of my soldiers around with you? Jacob says, that, why is that? That's not necessary. Like, just trust me a little bit. So Esau says, okay, we'll meet you back at Seir. But Jacob doesn't go to Seir. He goes a different way and goes to Succoth. And the Bible doesn't say that they went and joined together later at some point, but when Jacob has in his encounter with God, his mission changes. I'm not just going back to my father's house in peace, but God's given me a promise of prosperity in this land, and I, I got to go a new direction. There's a new mission for my life. There's something else that I have to accomplish that God gave me when I encountered his face. And he didn't know what it was until that moment when he wrestled with God all night long. And a lot of us, if we feel lost at all, it'll feel lost in direction. And you want that direction. Move from the house of God to the face of God. Amen. And let him change your direction. So Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. I'm in verse 18. And on his way from Padan Aram, and he camped before the city, and from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought a hundred pieces of money, a hundred pieces of money, the piece of land which he had pitched his tent. And there he erected an altar and called it El Aloe Israel. God, the God of Israel. No longer God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac. But where he camped down, he says, the promise is fulfilled. When you said you would bring me to this land, you would fulfill all your promises to me. And if you would do that and bring me back in peace to this land, you will then be my God. And he named that place God, the God of Israel. And he belongs to him. And he became his at a place when he had nothing to offer God. He didn't make a sacrifice of any of his goats. He had already given them all away. All he had left was just himself and the ability to wrestle. And God shows up and says, that's all I want. You're my God now. You're my God now. Your word is mine. Your promises are mine. And I'm yours. Hallelujah. And there's a relationship there. 
Next time Jacob gets in trouble, God directs him and he invites him. His children get him into a lot of trouble. He says, we got to get out there. God said to Jacob, Genesis 35 and 1, God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Arise, get up, go to the house of God and dwell there. Not visit there. Not go check it out. Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. A lot of translations has that as abodes or dwelling places. A place where you live. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. It's a permanency. It's a stay there. And so the next time he gets into trouble and needs a way out, God tells Jacob, go to the house of God. Live there. That place where angels ascended and descended on that ladder where I communicated with you for the first time and made promises to you. Where I desire to make a covenant.